nothing new for someone to be standing in front of a group of young people talking about sexual immorality or talking about fornication. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Very famous passage about sexual immorality, about fornication. And it's nothing new for someone to be standing in front of a group of young people talking about sexual immorality or talking about fornication. Uh, in fact, it happens all the time. The reason it happens all the time is because um, you people are in your sexual prime. I don't know if you know that or not. But you are at that age in your life, at that period in your life, where you are at an optimal stage to create babies. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Incredibly fertile, and you know your your desires and appetites and all these sorts of things, they're just there, right? This is that period in your life, and so you have hormones that are raging that are driving you toward this thing that God really created you for, right? Amen. <laughs> this, this lack of comfort that we're experiencing right now is part of the problem. See, here's what we do. Here's, here's what young Christians often do. We treat, we treat sex like it's this taboo thing that's just out there uh, and we put it in a category like other things that are evil right that's that's how we treat it you know sex no don't talk about that it's bad don't talk about that don't talk about that and yet there's a god who created you for that and you have natural god-given desires for that so it's not like things out there that are sinful that god says no where we should say uh uh no god says it's sinful no this is something that God says, yes. <laughs> Not just good, very good. Amen, hallelujah, <laughs> praise the Lord. It's good, right? But remember, we're over here saying, no, like it's something evil. But God says it's not evil. God says it's good and it's glorious. And we know deep down inside us that it's good and glorious, but we spend all these years telling ourselves that it's evil when we know it's not. As though that's the only way that we can avoid sexual promiscuity. But is that the way that the New Testament talks about this issue? It's not. Well, the Old Testament, the Bible talks about sex. Sex is a wonderful, beautiful thing. And so here in this passage that highlights very clearly the sin of sexual immorality, what Paul does is he gives us a theological framework for thinking about it. And I think that's a problem, that many of us don't have a theological framework for thinking about it. We just have, no, don't do that. No, that's bad. While everything in you is saying, actually, it's not. Not bad, not wrong. In this context, yes, it's like fire, right? Fire in a fireplace, warm the whole house. Let fire outside the fireplace, it'll burn down the whole house. Does that mean that you never use fire? No, we starve, right? So we have to have a proper theological framework for thinking about this. And, and it has to be something other than just, just no, just don't do that. Because when it's no, don't do that. And yet, it's all around you. And yet, you know that someday it'll be okay. Now, all of a sudden, your thoughts are running wild about it. And it's kind of like, well, well, why not? Well, Paul answers that question. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning of verse 12. First of all, it, it, it's sexual immorality, fornication, sex outside of marriage. I'll just use fornication here. Fornication is incompatible with the purpose of your body. It's incompatible with the purpose 
of your body. Verses 12 and 13. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are uh, lawful for me, but not all things, I'm sorry, but I will not be dominated by anything. These are, this phrase was popular among the believers in Corinth. Corinth was an incredibly wicked place. In fact, in, in some parts of the world, if a person was particularly sinful, you would say that they were Corinthianized. That's how awful Corinth was, right? It's kind of like you guys know about Las Vegas, you know? What do they call Las Vegas? Sin City, right? They call Las Vegas Sin City because of the things it's known for. And that's Corinth. Corinth is a sinful city. And so there was a saying in Corinth, all things are lawful to me. And they meant well by it. And what they were dealing with in many ways was this, 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 this issue of legalism. Paul says, using their phrase, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be dominated by anything. So he's saying that your, your, your phrase is almost correct, right? There is Christian liberty. That's what they're getting at in this phrase. There is Christian liberty. We don't live in legalism. There is Christian liberty. And he says, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Well, let's try to unravel this, right? The Corinthians are saying, all things are lawful to me. Pa Paul's saying, you know, in, in a sense, you're right. But not everything is good for you. And you shouldn't be dominated by anything. Take this to something that was very common and something that he deals with later on, this idea of the foods that we eat. It's, 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 it's lawful. You're, you're not, we're not restricted by the dietary laws. It's interesting. Um, there are people who come from those kinds of backgrounds where they've been restricted by dietary laws. Maybe somebody's been a seven-day Adventist. Maybe somebody grew up in, you know, in a Jewish household, and there were certain things that were just forbidden to them. And for them, it's a really big deal to eat certain things. Like bacon. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if somebody just said, you know, you can't have bacon. That's just not godly. Like, what god is that? Right? <laughs> All things are lawful. Peter and his vision on the rooftop, right? These things, all, all things are lawful. So, so th that's what's going on here, right? That's where this saying is coming from. All, all things are lawful. But the Corinthians were taking it beyond just this idea of, you know, certain foods no longer being off limits. The Corinthians are, are taking it beyond this to certain practices like, say, for example, temple prostitution. It's a normal part of their culture. It's no big deal. And Paul says, not so fast. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but you can't be dominated by anything. Which means that there, there are limits to your liberty. Food is made for the stomach, the stomach is made for food, but God will destroy both one and the other. What does that mean? Right? Food is made for the stomach, stomach is made for food. Yeah, sure. In that those things sustain you, but, but those things are going to be done away with. Right? You, you, you're not always going to have the same relationship with food that you do now. Your body and the way you use your body is another matter, especially as it relates to this idea of sexual purity. Your body is meant for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Listen to this from Kistemacher. 
God has given us natural appetites which we may satisfy in Christian liberty. For example, we are limited by natural and moral laws. Eating and drinking should be done with moderation, and sex should be kept within the bounds of holy matrimony. But if a person yields to sin, he is its slave, and sin his master. A person can freely exercise Christian liberty in all things, provided this takes place in communion with Christ. Are you free? Yes, you are. As long as that's taking place in communion with Christ. Are you free in terms of the things that you eat? Yes, but you can become sinful in that. You can become sinful in that. And so all things have to be kept in check. And Paul says, especially when it comes to the way you use your body related to sex and sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-5, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles, who do not know God. So fornication is incompatible with the purpose of our bodies. Our bodies exist for the Lord, which leads to the second point that Paul makes, which is fornication is incompatible with the union of our bodies to Christ. It's incompatible with the union of our bodies to Christ. Look at verse 14. And God raised the... and, and uh, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And later on he's going to, you know, sort of expound on this, right? We're members of the body of Christ, right? You did the hand, the foot, the eyes, right? We're, we're members of the body of Christ. So Christ is now doing his work in the world through not just the church in general, but through the individual members of the church who are the hands and feet of Christ as his kingdom advances. So we're, we're, we're members of the body of Christ. We belong to the body of Christ in that regards. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? That's a play on words there in the Greek. It's a play on the word pornea and pornea which is for prostitute, right? That's why he goes to prostitute, if you ever wondered that, right? Why is it? I mean, we're talking about fornication and sexual immorality, and you run straight to prostitutes? Well, two things. One, it's a play on words in the original language. But second, temple prostitution um, was very popular. Never, he says, it's a rhetorical question, his answer is never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Again, we're going back to Genesis here, right? He creates the male and female. He creates Adam. He creates Eve, right? For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife. Again, obviously, being referred to here, and the two shall become one flesh. There is a bond between a husband and a wife that is physical, that is emotional, that is spiritual. And the sexual union between man and woman is really the highlight and consummation of these things. And, and he's saying that that this is the equivalent, this is a picture, this is like us being joined to the Lord. We're joined to the Lord spiritually. We're joined to one another physically, which is this earthly picture of this spiritual and heavenly reality. It's, 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 it's not just some flippant thing. So there are two sides to this. On the one side, there is this idea that we are, the, we are the members of the body of Christ and we are there uniting the members of the body of Christ in sinful ways and in a sinful manner and in a sinful union. 
That's problematic. Because our union is with Christ. So we're actually bringing Christ into that sinful union. And he starts with this whole idea of the resurrection. God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by power. Why mention this? Well, because part of the problem is a worldview problem. You see, in the Greek mind, there was this radical division between the physical and the spiritual. And for some in the Greek world, they understood the physical and the spiritual to be so distinct and so divided that you could do things with your physical body and not be concerned about the spiritual consequences. So yeah, I may be doing this physically, but spiritually I'm committed to the Lord. And that's what really matters. Not what happens with the physical. That's a pagan idea. It's a pagan idea. And in addressing this pagan idea, what does Paul do? Paul goes to the resurrection of the body. This is massive when you think about it in terms of the Greco-Roman world, in terms of the Greek mindset. By, by the way, this is why the pagans, the pagans are the ones who burn the bodies of the dead. I tell Christians this all the time. Stop being cremated. Stop it. Stop it. We respect the body. We don't burn the body like the pagans do. Because we believe that our bodies will be resurrected. Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that who, he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Your body, it's not just thrown away. It's not just useless. You don't just do anything with it. We respect the body as Christians because we look forward to the resurrection of the body. 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. There is this union. This union between us and Christ. That is a spiritual union that will be consummated at the resurrection. And so, we don't just sort of separate our spiritual life from our physical life, and therefore, fornication, sexual immorality, becomes very complicated and problematic because we are taking our bodies, which are members of the body of Christ, which we, which we longingly anticipate being resurrected and made new like his body and being with our God in our bodies, if all of that is true, then it's hugely problematic to unite our bodies in such a sinful action that has such significant spiritual implication. Finally, Fornication is inconsistent with the holiness of our bodies. It's inconsistent, it's inconsistent with, the, with the holiness of our body. Inconsistent with the purpose of our body, right? Inconsistent with the, the union of our bodies with Christ, but it's ultimately inconsistent with the holiness of our bodies. Look at verse 18, verses 18 to 20. Flee sexual immorality. He, he finally gets to that, right? And, and let me go back to the point that I was making in the introduction. He, he's not dealing with sex the way we usually deal with sex. 
most people who've talked to you in your life as young people about sex, they just ran right to here. Sex, flee. Sex, run. Sex, no. Right? That's not what Paul does. He gives, he, he gives all of this, this theological framework.